everyone, Nikki Niverson here at the Salado Wildlife Education Center. Today we're going to be talking about pollinators and how you can help them in your own backyard. So we're going to give a couple of people a few minutes to get together and join us. And so when we do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a seasonal educator here at the Salado Center, and this is my fourth year and I am in charge of our pollinator garden. So our Monarch Way Station and our new bee garden, which is in the process. So hopefully by the end of this year, it'll look really, really good. So hopefully people have joined us by now and we're gonna get started. So today, like I said, we're gonna talk about pollinators. So first we're gonna talk about a global scale and what pollination is. And then we're gonna talk about Kentucky in general. So what is pollination? Pollination is when parts of the flower so pollen moves from the anther to the stigma so the male part to the female part so they can reproduce and make seeds so we have more plants so to demonstrate pollination for you kiddos out there we're going to take our little handy dandy butterfly here and we're gonna dip it in our pollen mixture so when pollinators move from plant to plant the pollen will stick to them on their little legs or their belly and they'll move from plant to plant and it gets transferred from different plants. So that is what we call cross-pollination. There are other pollinations as well. So there is self-pollination where a plant has both parts and it will pollinate itself. Or there's wind and water pollination where the elements take care of that. But most of our plants, so 75 to 95% of all the flowering plants in the world need a help of a pollinator to make sure pollination gets done. So we're gonna talk about how important these guys are. So in this next little picture up here on the screen is pollination via a pollinator. So you have one plant here and it collects, like I said, the pollen and it moves over to this other plant. And so, like I said, with our little butterfly friend here, do it one more time for the folks that didn't catch it. The pollen collects and then it'll move to another flower and when it lands that pollen goes off and that's how the pollination process works. So key players in pollination around the world globally there is so many critters that are considered pollinators. Bats, butterflies, bees, beetles, even flies. So if any of you at home have seen a Bradford pear tree you know how smelly those guys are. Well, those trees are fly pollinated. So flies are good to have around, especially for pollination. Wasps, hummingbirds, it all just depends where you're located at. But worldwide, we have about 200,000 species that are considered pollinators, which is really, really good. So pollinators on a global scale, we have the globe here. Should be able to slide on over. Like I said, we have 200,000 species worldwide that are considered pollinators. 75 to 95% of all flowering species in the world, all the plants, need the help of a pollinator to be able to make their seeds. If you like your food, your vegetables, your honey, coffee, whoever my coffee lovers are out there, if it wasn't for pollinators, we would not have coffee and I don't think I could survive for sure. But one out of every three bites of food, you can thank a pollinator. So if you see a bee or a butterfly, thank them because they make sure that we have enough food. And then if that doesn't get your attention, pollinators on a global scale, monetarily, money-wise, add $217 billion to the worldwide economics. So pollinators, like I said, are very, very important to have. Honeybees are specifically anywhere from two to five billion dollars just in the agriculture industry themselves. It's really important to have our honeybees, but also our native bees. A lot of people don't know, some plants can't be pollinated by people of that. Now pollinators are declining. We do have quite a variety of reasons why our pollinators are declining. The main reason is loss of habitat. Um, there's not enough overwintering spots or nectaring flowers or even host plants and we'll get into that in a little bit pollution so with everyone staying indoors a lot of people have noticed air pollution has gone down water pollution has gone down 
So you see all these success stories of sea turtles that haven't been seen on a beach in 30 years coming up. So us people, we got to make sure that we keep our pollution down to a minimum, especially the world is kind of trying to reverse what we've done. So make sure that you reduce, reuse, and recycle and try to keep pollution down to a minimum. We also have diseases and the misuse of chemicals. So with diseases, if you have honeybees at home or you've heard of colony collapse, that is when diseases come in and the colonies just kind of wipe out. And in the United States, our poor honeybee farmers, they have seen that a lot. They've had a decline of 40% in hives due to colony collapse over the last 10 years, and it's a big issue. The misuse of chemicals, some chemicals like Jeff talked about the other day about eagles like DDT, those pesticides and controlled chemicals, sometimes they cause bigger issues than what people think. And so we need to make sure that we realize what chemicals we're using and what effects they do, not just on a small scale, but on a larger scale. We wanna make sure that we're good to go. Now, with these issues, people always wonder, what can I do? What can I do to help? So there's quite a bit of things that you can do. Um, you want to make sure that you plant habitat. So for the monarch butterflies, my friends that love monarchs, you know that you need a host plant and that happens to be the milkweed species. So if you don't have milkweed, monarchs can't lay their eggs and the caterpillars need that specific type of plant to eat and make sure that they can grow into these beautiful butterflies. You also need nectaring plants and you wanna make sure your nectaring plants, you have them throughout the season. So these right here are spring plants. We have the Ohio spiderwort, which is really pretty. It just bloomed just the other day. So if you haven't seen them yet, don't worry. It's time to, for them to start blooming. We also have the wild columbine. This one is gorgeous. I love this flower. We have the golden alexander here, which is also really, really pretty, and the wild geranium. So these are all springtime nectaring plants, which is good to have, but you want to make sure in your gardens you've got a variety. So we have the spring flowers. You want to make sure you have summer flowers and fall flowers. So some fall specific natives for Kentucky, Joe Pye weed, goldenrod, ironweed. Um, those are really good to have. You also have for the summertime, we've got mist flower, which is really good, black eyed Susans. So you want to make sure you have a variety of things and things are blooming every time of the year. Not necessarily winter time because our pollinators do go in and make sure they're cozied up for the winter. But during the rest of the time of the year, you want to make sure you have enough food and shelter and things. Speaking of shelter, you want to make sure that in your yard you have places for protection from the elements. So make sure there's a nice place where butterflies can hang out. We have a bee house right here, so you can build your own. We do have plans for that, and you can find some online as well. But bee houses specifically, so honeybees, they live in a hive. A lot of people that keep honeybees, they're right there in their own space. But a lot of people don't realize in the state of Kentucky, our bees are actually, honeybees are just a very minute number. Most of our bees, which is almost 2,000 species, is mostly solitary bees or ground nesting bees. So you wanna make sure for our ground nesting bees that they have a nice place of dirt where they can dig and live. Now, if you are notorious for putting down that landscape fabric, that is not good if you wanna make sure you have ground nesting bees. And the reason why is because they can't penetrate through that fabric. So make sure you have just a little space, not much, for them to be able to get into the dirt. Bumblebees are the same way. They actually are in the ground. And bumblebees are very, very important. So yes, our honeybees are important. I'm not knocking their importance at all, but our native bees are also just as important when it comes to pollination. So make sure you have some sort of housing. And then, so you have your food, your shelter, you have your host plants. You also wanna make sure that you have a water source. And so this is a little dish here. It's very thin. And the reason why there's a bunch of rocks in there, some people are probably like, why do bugs need rocks? So our pollinators, if this was just full of water, they don't have a landing platform and they could get swallowed up by the water and drown. And we don't want that. So you wanna make sure that you have plenty of rocks and then when you put your water in, you don't wanna fill it to the very top. You just wanna make sure there's enough water, but there's plenty of space. See how that is? 
that they can get water, but they have a platform to land on so they're not stuck in the water and we don't want them to drown. So on really hot days, you might have to check it every day to make sure there's plenty of water in there, but you wanna make sure that you have a water dish, which is really good to have. So I think we've got some questions and we'll answer them. So why do we need pollen? So pollen is the portion of the plant that helps make the seeds. So pollen comes from the male portion of the plant and it needs to get to the stamen to get together and make a seed. Now seeds are important because without seeds, you lose that next generation of plants. So you have to make sure that you have pollen. Now this is fake pollen, it's made out of flour. You guys can make it at home. Um, but it is important to have the pollen. No pollen means no plants. And without plants, us people, we would be in a world of hurt for sure. Next question, what is the lifespan of a monarch butterfly? That's an awesome question. So depending on what time of year monarch butterflies emerge depends on their lifespan. So usually in the state of Kentucky, by the time you see a monarch, it's usually a second generation monarch because of their migration pattern which is really interesting and that's a whole nother spiel. And if you go back and watch Michaela's video from a couple weeks ago, she talked specifically about monarch butterflies. But in general, monarchs can live three to six weeks. And then if they emerge in the, the fall during the migration season, they can live up to six months because they have to make that migration down to Mexico, over winter there, and then come back up to make that next generation of monarch butterflies, which is really interesting. Ooh, another good question. Can I plant any species of milkweed or do I have any suggestions? So if you have a really large space, you could plant common milkweed. Now common milkweed, it gets a little crazy once it's established. So if you don't want it everywhere, you gotta make sure that you, you pull some up and that's perfectly fine. Butterfly milkweed is a really good one to have. If you have a wet area, you can also do swamp milkweed. Now, if you wanna know more about monarchs, we have this right here. It's the Kentucky Monarch Conservation Plan that the department has put together. Now in this plan, and you can get this on our website, we have all kinds of things talking about the life cycle, the migration pattern. We also have different projects that we've done and then you have plants as well in here. So it'll tell you more about the nectaring plants and specifically the milkweed that you need to make sure that monarchs are around. So if you are a farmer and you have a big field, make sure some of the weeds are actually native plants and they're important to some of our native pollinators. So make sure you leave a strip around your crop plants and everything and it will be fine. Let's see, any other questions? Ooh, we got a couple. What type of bees live in Kentucky and how many are endangered? Okay, so that's a really good question. There's a lot of bees in the state of Kentucky. I don't know the exact number, but I will get it to you and I'll make sure I put it in the comments. But bumblebees, we have 12 species of bumblebees. Now some of the bees, it's hard to know because there's so many species, but there are a couple that are going instinct or endangered just because of habitat loss and pollution and things like that. So we got to make sure that we get together with each other and have habitats ready for them. Now, one thing you can do, you can also learn. So like I said, we had the K Kentucky Monarch Conservation Plan. We also have a Kentucky Pollinator Protection Plan and a Pollinator Handbook through the USDA, the Par Department of Agriculture, and then Fish and Wildlife has helped as well. And you can look these up online and it gives you really good information about our pollinators and what we are trying to do to make sure that we have enough habitat and nesting materials and nectaring plants. So that is a good question, but I will get that answer for you. It might take me a little bit, but I will get it to you. What is the best time to plant a pollinator garden? So right now is actually a really good time to plant a pollinator garden. You could have done it a couple weeks earlier than right now, but if you want to get started, it is a great time to get started. You can go, we have several local nurseries that are native, that sell native plants. So you don't always have to do native, but native bees here in the state of Kentucky and some of our pollinators 
The more you plant native, the better options they have. So you, we have a list. The next time you come to Slato, when we're open, um, come and stop at the front desk. You can ask for the native nursery list that we have and you can get in contact with those people. They're really, really great. Let's see. Does Kentucky Wild help pollinators in Kentucky? Yes. So you've probably heard about Kentucky Wild throughout some of our Facebook posts. Kentucky Wild is a very awesome opportunity. So Kentucky Wild is a new membership base in the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife and it helps with the non-game or the diversity species. So monarchs specifically along with other pollinators, Kentucky Wild does help. And just because it says Kentucky Wild, if you are out there and you're not from Kentucky does not mean you can't join and help out. So that is a really good question. Do we need bees in order to survive? That is an amazing question. Yes, we need bees. We need butterflies, beetles, flies is a good one. Wasps, a lot of people don't like wasps, but they are pollinators. So we do need all of our species of pollinators to make sure that we have enough plants and we have enough food source and that the world keeps going around. So without our pollinators and the plants that need them, we would not be able to survive very well. So we do need our bees. Are there any additional resources to learn more about pollinators? Yes, there is. So like I said, we've got plans on the websites that you can find about pollinators and conservation plans. There are also opportunities, especially right now when people are staying at home, to learn more. So Michigan State University and Penn State, they have classes that you can take for free to learn more about pollinators and being a pollinator partner and conservationist. And you also have opportunities to become a citizen science. So pollinator partnership right here is an amazing source, Monarch Joint Venture, that's their little logo right there. These places you can learn, you can be part of citizen science projects to help us scientists learn more about our pollinators, how the, the populations are doing, why we need more habitats, where we need more habitats at. And so if you want, go on search pollinator, how I can help, where I can learn on Google or any other source and you will be able to find something so you can learn. How about wood bees, are they needed? Yes, so carpenter bees are one of our largest species of bees in the state of Kentucky, but yes, they are pollinators. You do need them. I know they can be a little bit destructive, but if you put a piece of wood out in your yard, hopefully they will eat that instead of your porch. But yes, they are very important to have. They are pollinators and they have a portion and a purpose for what they do. How do you obtain a Monarch Way Station certificate? Oh, that is a really, really great question. So if you go on, and let me see if I can find it here. Watch, I won't be able to find it now. <laughs> um, you can go and certify your backyard or your way station through Monarch Watch. And there's a whole process if you go to their website you might have to scroll a little bit and you'll see it certify my way station. Now it doesn't have to be a way station per se, but any sort of garden that has milkweed and nectaring plants that monarchs need, you can go and you can sign up. Now there is a little fee, but it will be put into the national database. It will help with monarch conservation plans and things like that. So you can look that up and join there. So, let me see what else we can talk about. So we talked about our native plants, very, very important. Make sure that you have them throughout the seasons. Make sure you have a water dish that has rocks and landing platforms for your wild pollinators. Make sure there's a, some sort of shelter for them. So bees, you can look up. We have plans where you can find houses and things where you can make it. It's a project, fun project for kids to and parents to do, especially right now when everyone's stuck at home, why not learn how to build a bee house or a, a sod bank? So some books that you can do. So if you're interested in learning more, so we've got different books 
like this that'll tell you all about pollinators of native plants. So you can look up a specific plant and see what kind of pollinators pollinate that plant. And so you can actually see what's going on. This is an amazing book resource that you can use, especially if you are into helping our pollinators out. You can, I want to be more involved with monarchs or butterflies or specific bees. You can see what plants those uh, pollinator species really enjoy and you can plant some of those. And it'll tell you all about when to plant it, what kind of shade or sunlight. It's great resources. Also, if you want to learn more about butterflies, we got one book like this. It's really cool. It tells you actually all about what the caterpillar cycle is, what the host plant is. Let's see. Host plant and nectaring plant. So it'll tell you what these butterflies need. And if you want to see specific ones, it's a really good resource to have as well. One of my favorite ones is this book, especially about bees. So it's the bee book. Now there's several other books like this. I'm not trying to like push a book on you for sure, but this book is really interesting. It tells you the history and how to plant and collecting. It also shows wildlife gardening. So just because it says wildlife gardens for bees does not mean that it's not good for any other species. Your birds, your butterflies, your bees, anything, squirrels even. If you want to make sure that you have more wildlife coming into your backyard and you want to see it, get some resources, plant some plants. It'll be great, Tom. So before we head out, do we have any other questions? Let's see. Do hummingbirds pollinate? Yes, they do. That's a great question. So in the state of Kentucky, we do have the ruby-throated hummingbird, and they are pollinators. Something like the columbine, which they're not here yet, but plants like this and certain plants need hummingbirds because they can get down in to the spot with the pollen other better than butterflies or bees. Just like I said, bumblebees pollinate tomatoes. It just kind of depends. Each plant has specific needs and pollinators are specialists along with generalists. Sometimes they go and they can hit several plants. Sometimes they only pollinate one specific plant. So we need to make sure that all of our pollinators are protected. That was a great question. Now, before I head out, I want to challenge you guys. The next time you go outside, especially when it's nice outside, catalog what kind of pollinators you see, what kind of bees, what kind of butterflies. If you want to plant a pollinator garden in your backyard, send us pictures. Take a picture of what you've done. Send it to the Salado page. We'd love to see how you're helping your native pollinators out. So if you have any questions, comment again and I will answer them as soon as I can. But thank you so much for joining me today and learning about Kentucky pollinators and how you can help them.